<clears throat> so tectonic compaction. Um, so now imagine a scenario where you have a reservoir. There's some sealed layer. And let's draw it this way. So you have a reservoir. And then at some point in time, faulting occurs, such that the reservoir Due to faulting now, appears like that. Right. So you initially have this nice continuous reservoir, and then all of a sudden a fault occurs, right? and you have some shift. You have this this type of thing. Right. Everybody understand my conceptualization there? What happened? But uh, after that faulting occurs, you'll have continued tectonic motion. Right? The plates are still moving around, still pushing on these guys externally. But, but now you have this fault. So whereas you know, before, the fluid was free to move from one side of the reservoir to the other, now it's sealed, and the, and the volume has shrunk. Right? And so now you have also stresses on these sides, and you have a squeezing of a, of a smaller volume, right? So you have the same force applied to a smaller volume. That's going to cause an overpressurization scenario with respect to the original volume. So that's what we, that's what we talk about when we say tectonic compaction. And so then again, this is where you have large-scale tectonic stresses that occur over geologically short periods of time. So normally we talk about tectonics, you know, geologic time. We're talking about tens to hundreds to millions of years, right? T tens of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of years, right? But you can have a major earthquake event or fault that, you know, within seconds could change. Yeah. Do what? Oh, I'm just I just mean you know in my original drawing this was all one reservoir, right? So this is a larger volume. The reservoir had a larger volume, subject to a fixed amount of tectonic stress. Right? Now you have some major faulting event that occurs. You still have the same tectonic stress applied to a smaller volume. That's going to cause a pressure increase. Right? Because remember, it's the same. You, you can think of uh, pressure is, is, you know, just like stress is force per unit area, right? Um, in, in a sense of a, uh, of a volumetric stress, it's, it's like a, 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 an externally applied hydrostatic pressure per unit volume. So if you shrink the unit volume, then you're going to get a larger, you know, shrink the denominator, you're going to get a larger stress. You look confused. No. If I um, go back to our 1D definition of stress, right? Say I have a force F divided by a fixed area, right? the area of that table leg right there, right? Oops, sorry. <laughs> I was about to do a real live experiment or what I can. Now, imagine the force in that case is my body weight, right? Imagine we replace that table leg with your pencil, and then I try to do the same thing. Right? Now, in that case, We've also changed materials, but just in your thought experiment, shrink, shrink the area, right? Even a, even a wooden leg would ho probably hold my weight, right? But your pencil won't, and all we've done is shrink the area, right? 
the force is me. Okay? So the stress went up. Stress went up. So the same, same thing here. It's just now it's a three-dimensional thing. The force is the externally applied tectonic stresses, but I've shrunk the volume instantly because of tectonic motion. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'm assuming because the thing's in equilibrium, right? So I have this, initially when it's one, when it's one uh, reservoir, this force must equal that force, right? Then you have some major faulting event. This force must equal that force. That force must equal that force, right? So the forces are the same. This is the same force now applied over a smaller volume. That's the same force applied over a smaller volume. The same ideas as that. Um, so you can have overpressurization just due to the fact that there are hydrocarbons there. I mean, so far when we talk about fluids in a reservoir, we, we haven't really tried to distinguish one fluid from another. I mean, a lot of times you just use water or something as a model fluid. But in reality, you have a multitude of fluids in the reservoir, including gases, and hydrocarbons will rise to the top. And so just the fact that there are hydrocarbons in yeah? Um, I'm not sure. Ask your question again. I got rid of my picture. When the fault occurs, you're saying that things can be mounted in the same stress applied to a smaller volume, therefore not like the top pressure being applied. Mm -hmm. To relieve the stress in some way. Yeah, I mean, my picture is very idealized, right? This is like oh, you have one continuous reservoir, and all of a sudden you have two that are small, right? Uh, in reality, it is much more complex than that. It's probably unlikely that the fault itself would be completely sealed, right? There's probably going to be fluid leakage into the fault, which would relieve some pressure. Um, there could be, like you said, secondary fractures that relieve stresses and everything like that. So in reality is real messy. My picture was real simple to try to explain the concept. But it's, it's still the same idea. And it's, of all the mechanisms of overpressure, it's the first one we understand the best. The, the other ones are somewhat speculative, and, and, and you have to have a... You have to have sort of an imagination to, to understand that these this is the way it occurs, right?